I'm A.G. Harmon, Clinical Assistant Professor at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. Each year, our school presents the Columbus School of Law Student Scholar Series, recognizing the academic contributions of three students chosen from a field of nominees, all of whose scholarly work has been selected for a significant contribution and in the field of their interest. The awardees for 2010, Tiffany Rowe, Nance Rickard, and John Heakin, will present their work to an audience of family, friends, fellow students, and practitioners, and take questions from respondents knowledgeable in the subject area concerned. Video clips of the seminars will be made available on this site over the next few months, and I hope that all will return to the site in future to view this unique scholarly enterprise at our school. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to the first uh, presentation for 2010 uh, with respect to our Student Scholar Series program. Um, this program was uh, instituted for the purpose of, of recognizing notable student scholarship that's produced by, of course, members of our student body here at Catholic during the year. But it will also uh, give our students uh, the opportunity to um, hone their skills that are associated with, with presenting and defending that scholarship in a, what we would call a professional conference style setting. Um, our speaker today is Ms. Tiffany Rowe, and she will be presenting a paper, Changing Executive Compensation, Widening the Lens and Focusing on Directors. And of course, the uh, individual who will be um, asking her to defend her thesis is our one and own, only Professor David Lip Lipton. Uh, the reason that we did this uh, series was to sort of create a, an additional opportunity uh, by which our students can be recognized and distinguished for their excellent work um, with respect to the written work and the argument that they are making with respect to their papers, but also giving them the opportunity to um, have, a, have a forensic presentation of that work as well, one of the most critical uh, skills that we need as lawyers. This whole program is the creation um, and the brilliance uh, of our colleague, Professor A.G. Harmon. Professor Harmon teaches classes here at the law school in jurisprudence law and literature, advanced legal research and writing, journal writing, law journal editing, and every now and then he gives us an opportunity to reflect on the beautiful work of the bard Shakespeare as well. Uh, he also teaches here at the university in our university's creative writing program. He is what I would call our true renaissance man at the law school. I'm sure some others might want to debate that, but I'm certain that he gets the top vote from me. So with that, I would like to turn the program over to Professor Harmon so that he can tell us a bit more about our presenter today, Ms. Tiffany Rowe. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Miles. I'll, uh and thank you all for coming uh, tonight. Before I introduce our, our student scholar, our first student scholar, Tiffany Rowe, I'd like to introduce, as you know, our respondent uh, to the presentation today, Professor David Lipton. Uh, of course, Professor Lipton teaches securities regulation, corporate finance, and corporations here at CUA. He's also the director of the Law School Securities Regulation Program. Um, he's uh, lectured and taught extensively. He's widely published, more widely admired, and um, According to the website, he has an avid interest in sculling, hiking, rollerblading, and skiing. So I thought I'd say that tonight. Thank you. I appreciate him being here today. This month's student scholar is Tiffany Rowe. Tiffany is a 2002 graduate of George Washington and received her BBA in marketing. She is a member of the Securities Law Student Association and spent two years on the CUA National Securities Moot Court team for the Kaufman Memorial Moot Court competition at Fordham Law School. Both years, she won the preliminary round Best Speaker Award. For the past five years, she's worked in the General Counsel's Office of Ernst & Young, and this fall, she'll be joining Marston and Foster as an associate, and that's a, a great accomplishment, and we congratulate her on that today. Tiffany uh, began her research, and her research springs from an interest in whether the market sets executive compensation alone 
or whether other factors are also at play. Recently, executive compensation has come under fire as tough economic times bring shareholder declines in their portfolio values while executives continue to reap millions of dollars in compensation. Her paper suggests that changes to director compensation, as well as to the processes directors use to determine executive compensation, will help reform current CEO pay packages. So now I'll turn the floor over to the first of our 2010 student scholars, Tiffany Rowe, on the topic of her presentation, changing executive compensation, widening the lens, and focusing on directors. Thank you. Tiffany. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon. I would like to first thank Dean Miles, um, Professor Harmon, Professor Lipton, um, and I'd also like to thank Professor Goldman, who um, could not be here this afternoon, but um, did assist me in um, kind of formulating my topic uh, regarding executive compensation. Um, Executive compensation is really a, a hot button issue right now, especially with everything that's been happening in the financial markets over the past two to three years. Um, with these economic problems, you see individuals losing their retirement, losing their investments, losing their homes, and yet these CEOs continue to walk home with tens of millions of dollars every year. Um, the current solution that we've seen coming out of this seems to be uh, CEOs giving up their bonus packages for the year. Um, John Mack at Morgan Stanley went, decided to forego his 2009 bonus. Just yesterday, Barclays announced that their CEO and president both would uh, not be taking a bonus for 2009 as well. Um, while this is, <clears throat> excuse me, while this seems to be um, the recent wave of response to this, it really doesn't fix the problem. It's really just a, a band-aid or an appeasement of the public um, based on the public outrage that has come in response to um, the financial markets and their, their downturn. Um, what we need to do is look at executive compensation um, and make some systemic and long-term changes to how compensation is set um, and what the levels of compensation are. Um, this requires a focus not only on the amount and makeup of compensation, but also looking at how people come to decide what the compensation of a CEO will be um, and how those decision processes um, are actually carried out in the boardroom. Um, the position of a manager or an executive is really a standard um, agency relationship with the corporation and the shareholders. Um, in this circumstance, the principal um, shareholders will retain an executive as their agent um, to act on their behalf in running the company. Um, in doing so, you know, they keep the ownership of the stock, they give up some control over the corporation, but you still have that basic agency relationship. There are two general problems that arise from this agency relationship, the first being the standard agency problem. This is the fact that you have a disconnect between um, what the principal's goals are and what the agent's goals may be. Um, in order to make sure that these come into alignment, there are costs associated um, with doing so. There are costs of either monitoring the agents, um, there are costs of diversion when the agent actually carries out actions that do not um, work to the benefit of the principal. The second problem that arises is called the risk sharing problem and, and this stems from different risk preferences of the principal and agent. This is based on the fact that one action may result in a benefit for the principal um, but a deficit of some sort for the agent. So this is the second problem that we need to deal with in this general agency relationship. Two ways to um, address these issues are through monitoring and incentives. Monitoring would be your standard corporate governance measures. Um, incentives are obviously where executive compensation comes into play. There are uh, typically or generally three standard um, theories regarding executive compensation. The most traditional is called the optimal contracting theory. And optimal contracting theory is based on the assumption that um, the parties, the executive and the board of directors, bargain at arm's length when trying to come to a pay package that will satisfy both parties. Um, there are a lot of things that kind of indicate that this isn't really what happens and, and I think that that's pretty clear and it's become pretty clear over the past couple of years 
um, if not longer, that there are some relationships within a board of directors with the executives that that arm's length bargaining really isn't always there. Managerial power theory is a new theory, I'm sorry, not a new theory, but an uh, additional theory regarding executive compensation that looks at some of the behavioral theory behind the decision making that goes into setting compensation and coming up with pay packages for these executives. Um, managerial power theory says that uh, the executives and the directors do not really bargain at arm's length, but the CEO uses his power and influence that he has to try and get as much compensation as he possibly can while taking on um, the least amount of risk. Um, even though managerial power and the managerial power theory explains a lot of the holes in the optimal contracting theory. It really doesn't cover everything. Uh, one of the issues that really isn't addressed by managerial power theory is something like um, the independence of um, boards of directors over the past decade or so, we've had uh, increasingly independent boards as judged by the standards of um, self-regulatory organizations like the New York Stock Exchange, according to the rules of the Security Ex Securities and Exchange Commission and so forth. Um, yet, when it comes to executive compensation, the directors still really seem to be under the thumb of the CEO. And so managerial power doesn't really address an issue like that. That's really where uh, the group dynamics theory comes in. Group dynamics is another um, theory that is based on um, behavioral theory and how individuals act in a group, but it's really not conditioned upon the um, personal relationships between the individuals. Um, group dynamics theory basically looks to the flaws in the decision-making process that can occur in any cohesive group, and that would result um, anytime you have a number of individuals trying to come together and come to a unanimous decision on something. Um, group, group dynamics is basically um, uh, an outspring of, um, of groupthink, um, where you have individuals who tend to follow other individuals um, based on what they see the person before them doing. Um, another way to, um, to look at this is, called, is something called a social cascade within the area of group dynamics. A social cascade is something that takes hold where you have a group of individuals who are making a, a decision on some issue, um, and there are two things that come into play. The first is that all of the individuals have limited personal knowledge on the ultimate matter on which they're deciding. The second issue is that all of the individuals in the group make their decisions one after another. So if you have a group of eight people, the first person votes on whatever the issue is, yes. The second person votes no. The third person votes yes. You now have a majority. And so all of the next individuals who make their decisions, number four, number five, number six, even if they um, have some personal information on the issue, they will look and see that now we have a majority of two people who say yes. If I say no, how do I know that the people who said yes don't have better information than I do? So this group dynamics theory really kind of fills some of the holes that are left by managerial power in explaining how um, directors come to these decisions on executive compensation. Um, there are other sources of information for the directors uh, that explain how they really come to these ideas. If you have a number of directors that uh, are making a decision on executive compensation, they may not be able to do so based on their own knowledge. So a, a very common way of um, gathering information on the issue of compensation is to hire compensation consultants. Um, a survey that was carried out for the House Committee on Oversight and Government um, Reform in 2006 looked at the issue of compensation consultants and how they're used in executive compensation um, setting of pay packages. Um, it, out of the 250 companies that um, that have to come to a decision on executive pay, um, 197 of them retained a compensation consultant. Out of that 109, I'm sorry, 194. Out of that 194, 179 of those consultants were from one of the big four consulting firms. Um, now, these consulting firms are very much like the big four accounting firms in that there are four of them. They're very general practice, and so they don't just do compensation package consulting. Um, they do consulting for HR, payroll, um, different kinds of managerial things. And so you often have um, these firms that may consult a company on executive compensation, but they also handle other things. 
Um, when you look at the amount of money that a company spends on um, executive compensation consultants, it's usually in the range of uh, $50,000 to $200,000 a year. The costs of some of the other consulting fees that um, they may have with these big four consulting firms can range up to um, 11 or $16 million for some of the numbers included in this um, committee uh, report. So out of those 179 that had one, a consultant from the big four, 113 of them had some kind of conflict. Now what this indicates is that these consultants that are helping management supposedly come to an objective determination on what their uh, executive pay packages should be really have their own interests that come into play. I mean, you're not really going to forego $11 million in consulting fees because you really want to give them a good number on, um, on what the executive compensation is going to be, which brings you a fee of maybe only $200,000. So this is one of the problems with how directors get information about executive compensation. Um, another issue is actually what the consultants do when they come in to advise on this. Um, two very standard forms of um, providing information to a board of directors are the use of salary surveys and the use of peer groups. Um, peer groups generally will provide a board of directors of a company with information on a peer group of, of other companies within their industry. Um, it's usually based on size, revenue, profits, things like that. Um, but basically what it does is it gives you a snapshot of the market. What this has done, unfortunately, is it gives a benchmark to these boards of directors to use for setting their pay scales. Now, in theory, it sounds great, but in practice, what has happened is each board looks at this information that they get from their compensation consultant. They say to themselves, well, our CEO is great. He's definitely above average. We want to compensate him accordingly for that. Um, a survey uh, that looked at um, the use of compensation consultants, the use of peer groups, showed that um, out of all of the companies that, that use these kinds of peer groups, 65% of the companies shoot to um, compensate their executives in the 50th percentile, and 35% shoot to compensate their um, executives in the 75th percentile. So this is a very clear mathematical anomaly, yet it results in all of these companies pushing their pay up the next year. Everybody gets a new peer group number, and they look at the compensation again, and once again, um, the level of compensation goes up. So we've really seen a ratcheting up of compensation over the years without anything to really bring it back down. Um, directors also get information about executive compensation from um, other areas, um, mainly the CEO candidate or the incumbent CEO that's coming in and is, and is negotiating his own pay package. Um, one question is how does the CEO really decide what is going to be fair compensation for him? Well, the 1990s NAS saw something that has now been referred to as the cult of the CEO. And during that time period, what happened was the, the position of CEO really kind of changed. And it was no longer looked at as, we want this CEO because of his business acumen, because he knows how to run a company. It kind of shifted to looking at the CEO as a celebrity. They're like the face of the corporation. If our CEO you know, flies around in private jets, if our CEO has a limousine or black car service, this is really ref reflecting on the company and showing how well the company is doing. So shareholders, in essence, started paying for a superstar when really it, what they should have been looking at um, and what they should have been compensating for was what the value of the CEO would be to the firm. Um, some other things that come into play and provide the manager with more power um, with which he could bargain on his, um, his compensation is in areas where you have or circumstances where you have urgency or uncertainty. If your CEO for some reason um, leaves the firm all of a sudden, if he passes away, if uh, he's fired for some reason, the board is in a position where they probably want to get a new CEO in as quick as possible, either to quell the markets, if there's been a substantial drop in share price, um, if there's talk of the company really being um, in turmoil, they'll really rush to get somebody in and try and have a corporate savior come in rather Rather than bicker over whether your pay is going to be 500,000 stock options or 600,000 stock options. 
Um, the third thing that um, provides even more managerial power, and this is really applicable whether you're dealing with a new CEO or an incumbent CEO, is the manager's power over director retention um, and compensation. Michael Dorf, who is uh, an assistant dean at Southwestern Law School and a graduate of Harvard Law, um, is the individual who came up with the group dynamics theory. He's also done some research on this issue of what the effect is of having um, your executives with power over your directors. He carried out a classroom experiment um, where he took students and he put them in groups of three, um, which were basically small boards of directors. Um, he did it in two phases. In the first phase, the student boards of directors were um, required to pick a CEO based on um, their managerial skills. And they were you know, based on numbers one to five. Number one, your managerial skills and your business skills are low. Number five, they're, they're higher. Um, in the first phase, the board of directors would choose the CEO and put him in place. And then at the end of the round, the directors would come to a unanimous vote on their own compensation and on any retention decisions or whether one of the directors would be leaving the company. In the second phase, um, the student boards of directors were again required to pick a CEO based on the same one through five um, scale of your, your um, business ability. Um, but now the CEO had the opportunity to make retention and compensation decisions at the end of the round. Um, this resulted in a pretty significant difference. Beforehand, only 28% of, in the first phase, only 28% of the CEOs that were hired by the student board of directors were given excessive compensation, Excef excessive compensation being that beyond the value that the individual would bring to the firm. In phase two, where this CEO can now make decisions regarding the retention and the compensation of the directors, they gave excessive compensation in 73% of the cases. So where you have a manager that has power over these things, where the executive either sits on a board, has significant influence on a board, has something to say about director nominations or anything of the like, um, directors are more likely to give them a higher compensation level. This is really where the interaction of um, the managerial power theory and the group dynamics theory really come into play. Um, the managerial power theory, as, as I've mentioned before, does kind of have this requirement that um, the directors look at the CEO or the um, incoming CEO and they see some kind of power or influence in that individual, whereas group dynamics doesn't require that. The reason why this is so important is because it shows that where you have boards that have a number of independent directors or even a majority of independent directors, you still have the opportunity for these social cascades, for these boards to come to a unanimous decision that really just gives the CEO whatever he wants. Um, once you have all of these individuals just kind of following suit, this is where we kind of end up where we are today, where the um, compensation level is justified by what everybody else is getting paid, the compensation level is justified by what we've done before, and it's justified by how we're seeing it um, based on this managerial power and these group dynamics issues that come into play. Um, there are some external constraints on the levels of executive compensation, though there aren't many. The first is public outrage. Um, this is kind of what we're seeing today where all of these CEOs are giving up their bonus compensation because everybody's just really mad about it. Um, well, there was a survey that looked at uh, compensation of CEOs between 1992 and 2006 to see what the effects of negative media coverage would be um, on compensation of CEOs. Um, this was kind of during the time frame where the issue of the issues issuance of stock options, um, which were great during like the IPO bubble, were now starting to be looked at as a windfall for executives. Um, and there was a lot of public outcry over this because these people were walking away with millions of dollars while you have these firms that are going under. The survey showed that in response to all of this negative media coverage, um, companies did in fact lower the overall um, compensation for CEOs, but it didn't lower very much. And the way that it was lowered was really interesting because they just changed the composition. The entire um, decrease in CEO comp uh, compensation at that time was based on um, 
you know, taking of stock options or stopping to issuing stock options. Um, but they continued to raise their base salary, they continued to raise bonuses, and they continued to raise perks. So even though salary is going down to kind of quiet the public, um, all of this compensation is kind of being made up just by shifting uh, what kind of compensation they're being given. Um, the other external constraint is the power of shareholders. Um, the first is, you know, we've seen a lot of um, movement for say on pay, a lot of uh, tries for companies to really look to the shareholders and have the shareholders give some kind of sign off on what executive compensation would be. Unfortunately, even if a say on pay does get passed at a company, it's non-binding and doesn't really have any effect since the directors could just disregard it anyway. Um, the best way for shareholders to really show that they're not pleased with a decision of management or the board of directors is just to sell the stock. Um, obviously the problem with this is, A, you need enough people who sell the stock so that there's actually a movement in the stock price, and B, even if there is that movement in stock price, there's still no way for management or the directors to know that the reason why everybody sold the stock is because of a decision based on executive compensation. So shareholders are really at a disadvantage at trying to demonstrate to the board of directors and to management that they're, they're not pleased with executive compensation decisions. Um, stock options have been misused. Um, they are generally the cornerstone of the whole pay for performance idea, um, but it's clearly gone awry over the past decade or so in how they've been used. Um, one issue is that it tends, relying on the rogue stock price, just the stock price as it, as it stands in the market, um, isn't really an accurate reflection of the underlying value of the company. Um, so you could have fluctuations in market price um, and uh, an inaccurate reflection of um, the management, uh, management's actions or the company's actual returns um, based on you know, changes in the economy, changes in the particular industry and things like that. So without focusing more on what management is actually doing, stock options aren't really the best way to um, decide on executive compensation. Basically what all of this comes down to is trying to find a better way to motivate directors to give more consideration to what kind of compensation individuals are granted, what CEOs are paid and how much and how they are paid. Um, there are two basic ways to do this. Um, I think that the first way to do it, which is already used in a lot of, com uh, a lot of companies, is to implement meeting fees. Um, this is basically where uh, directors get paid a small fee, small being about $1,000, which is smaller for some of us than it is for others, um, but they get about a fee of $1,000 for each meeting that they attend. Um, there are basically two points to having a meeting fee, um, because the first argument is always that, well, $1,000 really doesn't mean to somebody who's worth $12 million. Well, okay, that's kind of a good point if you think about it just logically, but actually the research shows the opposite. Um, it actually turns out that high worth individuals are motivated by small sums that are given for very specific actions, such as attending um, directors' meetings. Um, the second thing that comes out of these meeting fees is that it's a way of telling directors that this is a very important thing that we as the company want you to do. We're willing to pay you for this. We're trying to signal to you that your attendance at these meetings is really important. Um, a survey showed that uh, the companies that use meeting fees actually have better attendance than companies that don't. If you um, look at companies that use meeting fees and then actually take them away and instead implement higher uh, base retainer fees, the um, attendance problems while you have meeting fees in this um, subset of companies was about 13%, an attendance problem meaning that um, a director missed 25% or more um, of the meetings in, I believe it's a year. Um, so it was 13% where you have these meeting fees. Where you take away the meeting fees and instead you give a higher base retainer fee, the attendance problems actually jump to 25%. So regardless of whether the reason the meeting fees work is because they convey this information about the importance of the meetings or because people just want the money, you're still getting them there. So it seems to be a pretty good way to get directors at least to come to the meetings and be more involved. 
the second way to motivate directors is to compensate the directors based on stock-based uh, compensation rather than using stock-based compensation for um, management and executives. The reason for this is because directors are really supposed to stand in for um, the shareholders. They are supposed to be the interfa interface to management where such a widely held corporation, obviously all the shareholders can't come and tell the CEO what they think um, should be done. So if you put the directors in the exact same position as the, the stockholders, that their compensation, their entire compensation is based on um, the price of the stock, they are going to be motivated to ensure that management is um, carrying out programs and making decisions that are going to um, benefit the shareholders and benefit the directors. Um, I have a hard time imagining that a director that ends up with like $55 in compensation for a year is going to be willing to give the CEO thousands of dollars in, in compensation um, as bonus at the end of the year. So it seems to be a good way to protect against that. Um, the important thing with using stock-based compensation, however, is that it needs to be all stock-based compensation. Once you um, inject um, something like a fixed retainer fee, it really kind of takes away the incentive effect of um, the stock price and the stock-based compensation. Um, where you have that fixed fee as a base um, payment, the individuals will start to consider the stock-based compensation as an extra or as a bonus. And so if the stock doesn't come through and you don't have any return from that, it's really not an issue because I've already determined that the retainer fee will cover my opportunity cost for taking on this director position. Um, if you take that away, the director, on, when he takes on the director position, will say to himself, um, this position will cost me 240 hours of my time this year, which is the average time a directorship takes. In that time, my opportunity cost for that may be whatever he decides. It may be 60000 it may be $150,000. Um, but whatever it is, when they're left with the, the, uh, the risk that they would basically bring home nothing, nothing being something less than that opportunity cost that they've assigned to the directorship, um, they're really not going to be too happy to just let management run things how they are. They're going to be more involved in the oversight and more involved in making sure that the day-to-day -day operations and the activities of the executives work to bolster the stock price and keep the company in good form. And the other important part here is really changing the decision-making process that's used by uh, the board of directors when they decide on executive compensation. Um, one way to reduce groupthink is to um, use the dissent process in any kind of cohesive group where the group is trying to come to a unanimous decision. Um, one way that a board of directors can uh, bring dissent into their analysis for uh, executive compensation would be to use something called the dialectical inquiry. Now this is just one of various dissent processes that can be used. Basically the way the dialectical inquiry works is the group is split into two groups. You have a synthesis group and an uh, antithesis group. The first comes up with um, a plan, perhaps um, in this circumstance it would be a compensation package that's all cash. The um, opposite group would come up with a compensation plan that perhaps was all stock-based compensation. Um, the two groups would then have to come together, present their ideas, and work back and forth until they could come to um, a unanimous decision on how that compensation package package would be put together. So it really has two benefits. The first is by having these groups come up with these two alternative um, forms or two alternative answers to the question, um, you're working from better founded assumptions. The first group will really look at the best case scenario. The latter group will look at the worst case scenario. Where do we think the market's going to go? What do we think is happening in our industry? What are the effects going to be? Um, and second, you have a fuller consideration of the possible outcomes. Um, the people who are arguing for a complete, you know, cash compensation are going to 
have a vested interest in the argument that they're making, as would the people arguing for a completely stock-based compensation. Um, just this back and forth will give these individuals a vested interest in what they're arguing for, and it'll bring some of these issues um, to the top, and it will come out in their conversations rather than being um, muffled by, by groupthink. Some of the concerns regarding um, the revised decision-making process, um, I think that it's necessary that when groups use this dissent process and make these, these decisions based on this new decision-making process, there needs to be some kind of, um, some kind of disclosure regarding it. Um, but first we need to look and make sure that uh, they, the directors have all of the resources that they need to come to these decisions. The first is whether or not the information would be available. Um, the information that a board of directors would use for this um, is really already available because it's similar to what is already disclosed in the management discussion and analysis that issuers have to file as part of their 10-Ks with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, that information would include you know, things like any trends that they know are happening in the industry, what they expect the markets to do in the future, and so on and so forth. So the information is already there, it just needs to be used in a different way. Um, regarding the, the time uh, commitment, um, the average time a director puts into a directorship in a year is about 240 hours. It's kind of difficult to say what the effect would be on um, the time that they need to put into the directorship, but one way to address this would be to implement uh, maybe different meetings fees or higher meetings fees for the time spent in executive compensation meetings. Um, regarding the cost, um, there really already are so many costs associated with um, the gathering of information, the use of consul uh, compensation consultants and things like that. It's really just a shifting of cost. Um, but even if, you know, even though those costs are kind of hard to determine at this time, that really shouldn't be something that keeps this change from happening. We saw that happen uh, when Sarbanes-Oxley was passed and there was a big uproar about Section 404 internal controls requirements um, and individuals were really worried that it was such um, a lengthy process that it would be too costly to really implement. Well, years on, we know that the 404 process is actually working. It continues to be tweaked, um, which is something that we would need to do here as well. Um, but again, it shouldn't really stop this change from happening. Um, finally, the disclosure would need to be made in order for um, the board of directors to know that they're really um, required to give this some full thought and, and really let the shareholders know how they come to these decisions. Um, the way to make these disclosures would be something like um, the MD&A disclosures or related party disclosures. Um, this is the way that you would justify uh, putting this information about the board's decision-making process out to the public. Um, I mentioned that it's kind of similar to the, the MDNA in that they have to look at future trends and, and analyze what may happen um, in the future. Um, it's also similar to a related party transaction in that the individual CEO who is negotiating with the board of directors in the company is in such a position that there's the opportunity for collusion. And in order to kind of um, eliminate that, we should have the same kind of disclosure as we have with related party transactions, which are those transactions between a company and either an individual or another company that has some kind of vested interest in the first company. So there's there an opportunity for collusion. Um, and I think that a, a disclosure similar to related party transactions um, would be helpful in kind of getting rid of some of these issues. Um, the legal effects of the disclosure are also a concern. Um, you know, generally the decisions of the board of directors are protected by the business judgment rule, which means that uh, any of the decisions made by the board of directors is um, kind of protected um, unless there's some kind of violation of the duty of care, the duty of loyalty to the shareholders. Um, I think that uh, by having this disclosure of the decision-making process, it's necessary to also make the um, directors liable for any misstatements or omissions that may be included in that disclosure. This way, the liability is a little bit higher than um, the standard uh, business judgment rule, so there is still some opportunity um, for shareholders um, to come back at the directors if there's some kind of shirking of their duties. Um, 
inevitably there probably will be some frivolous lawsuits. I think that's something that comes up with any kind of change in legislation or government or uh, business regulation like this. Um, it's unfortunate, but I think that it's something that needs to be dealt with as it comes due, rather than letting it um, really stifle the changes that are so necessary in this area. Um, so focusing on director compensation um, and the decision-making process that they use is really um, central to a revision of um, the executive compensation packages that we see today, and hopefully um, this kind of reform will be forthcoming um, in the next few years. Thank you. somehow gave me the impression that there wouldn't be anyone uh, available to ask questions uh, if I didn't ask questions. Um, but uh, we have such a great turnout that let me suggest that we ask those in the audience if uh, first there are any questions that you have uh, about Tiff's presentation. And uh, I say, is, is Kathy Kelly here today? Oh, Kathy, yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, on the issue I don't know if it's necessarily the fact of the number of people. I mean, clearly, anytime the board of directors would make a decision like this, you need a quorum. So you kind of already have that floor of how many people you need there to begin with. Um, but I think really what it's meant to do is to have these individuals be more um, attentive to what the decision-making process is and, and really what the executive compensation issues are rather than having the director come in at the last meeting of the year when they're just about to take a vote and voting just because everybody else says, yeah, okay, let's go with this. So I think it's, I think it's really more of an issue of having people be better informed and in going through the process than the number of people. Kathy, I will and, and, uh, I'll go right to you, George, after that, but I, I will add um, to uh, sort of uh, back up what Tiffany said, um, about 12 years ago, the commission, SEC, added a requirement for disclosure that is given to shareholders at the time of uh, their proxy uh, vote that uh, when they're voting on board of directors, that the disclosure document reveal uh, the percentage of times that directors attended meetings, and if it's ever below 75 percent, that's really what you have to disclose. Uh, but all these uh, corporations, and, and at the same time, they instituted a, a proxy vote mechanism which allows you to instead of voting up and down for the whole block, to take individual directors out. Um, and corporations just delight in repeatedly saying we had 100% turnout of all directors at all meetings and at all committee meetings. And I think it's precisely as Tiff said that it reflects a certain attentiveness <laughs> whether or not that's true uh, and whether or not they're sleeping through some of these meetings. I don't think anyone knows, but George. Uh, Tiffany, thank you for this wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is, and you got to it right at the end, uh, do 
Do you think that derivative suits with a modified business judgment rule would play a primary regulatory role in getting compensation under control? Um, I think it's hard to say. I don't think that litigation is the best way to solve it. I think um, while it's a kind of a necessary evil, I say that with a bunch of lawyers in the room, um, but I think that there needs to be some other way to address it firsthand um, and allowing that kind of liability as a backup. Um, I think that there's more frivolous, there are more frivolous lawsuits out there than, well, obviously than we need, but I think that there's a lot of frivolous litigation and, and I don't necessarily know that um, revising the liability for the business judgment rule um, would really be the way to address it. That's why I think that having something that's kind of akin to um, the securities laws where you have liability for material misstatements or omissions um, would be a good way to go about it because then you're not saying, well, we're going to allow shareholders to second guess the decision you made, but we're just going to make sure that the decision that you made is, is clearly disclosed to us and we understand it and then you know there are other things that should be put in place. Shareholders should have more say on it through say on pay that perhaps is binding and things like that um, to kind of address the issue that way rather than waiting for it to get to litigation. Uh, Don? No, I think it does have an effect. Um, some of the research that I did in, in coming up to the paper, and I didn't spend a lot of time on the business judgment rule in the paper, but there's a lot um, to indicate that a lot of people say, you know what, I am done with directorships because it's just too much of a risk. Um, and whether it's because they would face litigation um, based on their decisions or whether it's the kinds of disclosures and things like that, people just don't really see um, it worth, they, they don't think it's worth it to take on the risk of being in that position. Um, and so I think that that protection is necessary, um, but I think that, you know, there should probably be some tinkering on, on how um, that kind of safe harbor is, is available and, and when it's not. And one of the big changes in um, the business judgment rule um, or at least protection of directors from any tinkering with business judgment rule is that about a half dozen years ago, um, uh, many states, particularly Delaware, put into effect uh, uh, power provisions in the uh, statutes uh, that allowed corporations to put in their charters indemnification provisions that were far broader uh, for directors than what they had been. Uh, and a lot of corporations have taken advantage of this. Uh, that notwithstanding, um, you probably all uh, have some recollection of uh, it's either the controller of the currency in New York or it was Elliot Spitzer, uh, both of whom have since left office under one shadow or another. Um, um, what was the uh, controller's name? It, it'll come to me. Uh, it was my counselor in camp. So, uh, uh, and in the decision, and it involved Judy Arene, because uh, who was the dean of Georgetown Law at that time, and she was on the board of. Um, Microcom, uh, the Virginia-based company, uh, uh, boy, that's a major uh, 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 senior moment meltdown, um, uh, a big dot-com company. Um, MicroStrategy? No, it wasn't MicroStrategy. It, it was one of the um, 
merged companies. In any event, the decision that came down and the settlement that they worked out, and as I said, it was either Spitzer or the controller, was that no matter what the insurance was, um, there had to be left over um, enough uh, of the penalty so that each of the directors would have to contribute to the award 10% of their net assets. And Irene probably paid in the least because, gosh, she was just a, you know, law school dean. Uh, sorry, girl. Uh, the, the others were uh, big money people. So what, what, I, I guess I'm saying both ends of the coin that, that, that uh, challenge that tinkering with business judgment has been lessened by statute, then again, clever prosecutors could intensify it. Uh, so it would be interesting to see how it would all play out. Ted, you had a question? Yeah, uh, thank you so very much for such a fine presentation. Uh, is excessive executive compensation inherently contrary to the public interest? Um, I think if you define excessive compensation as being that which goes beyond what is justifiable for what the, the CEO is doing, then yes, I think it is. Um, I think if you define excessive compensation as an amount of compensation above a certain number, $50 million, then no. Um, because a lot of the, the research that I came across discusses, well, should we put a cap on what um, compensation should be. Um, and if you do that, it kind of, it's like cutting off the ends of your pay for performance um, picture. So if you're saying we're going to compensate you based on how well the company does, you, you need to have the, the whole kit and caboodle available to follow through with what you're saying. But you just need to make decisions that um, that result in compensation that is adequate but isn't over the top. So it, it isn't that um, a certain number is excessive. It's that it becomes excessive when it's far beyond what the um, executive is able to do for the company. Uh, is, is Kathy Kelly here? Oh, oh, oh uh, Kathy. I'm sorry? The board of directors that decides whether the board of directors is entitled to indemnity from the company, or is that management that makes that decision? I'll answer that. Uh, it, it, uh, the, assuming that it had not yet been in the charter, mm -hmm. um, a, an amendment to the charter is affected by a vote of the board of directors and that vote then going to the shareholders and seeking a majority approval. The reality is <laughs> that there's very little that the directors come up with without advice from management because the directors typically don't have a staff. The only directors that have a staff working for them is under a new Sarbanes-Oxley rule, the audit committee has to have a staff if they ask for it. Um, and they, they ask for it. So yeah, it, it would be the directors voting for it and the shareholders voting to approve it. And of course, the, the language always, just as when they, you know, when a corporation reincorporates in Delaware and you look at the justification, the justification is, oh, we're going to be more efficient because we're going to be operating uh, in, a, in a jurisdiction that understands how business goes. And the, 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 the rationalization for this would be just the same. Um, isn't that funny? I, I still can't remember Judith Reen's company. It, it's like Microsoft, but only it's not Microsoft. It was one of the uh, companies that went down during Enron. They sold, sent communications around the country like AOL, but it wasn't AOL. Um, other questions? I'll tell you what we'll do. Yeah. We can't go teach. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you very much, all of you, especially if we have a late start tonight, but uh, this is an important thing to do because. Uh, as you can see, when you have somebody that puts this much work into this, and, and, and 
really a, a worthy enterprise uh, that we're encouraging by, by this kind of uh, support. And, and Tiffany, we thank you for, for all that you've done in, in making this presentation tonight and for starting the Students of Our Series off on, on the great foot that it has tonight. Professor Lifting, for your contributions. And again, thank you all. We'll have the, uh, a reception outside. You can join us and ask Tiffany any other questions. And we have a little token for you, uh, a pen that says Columbus School of Law Student Scholar Series. We we're, going to, we're going to take it back and put her name on it. She's going to get it. For now, I give it back. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.